What's up guys, Mike here from Ecom Knives, and today is FAQ number three. This is the video series where I answer some of your questions. If you have any questions or comments, put them down below, and I will do these once a month, uh, and I'll get to your question on the next one. So we have a bunch of good questions this week. Uh, I guess we'll just jump right into it. Uh, first one up is uh, Michael Cockrell. Uh, his question is... I have a question about different finishes and polishes. How would you go about making a mirror finish versus satin finish? Well, that's going to be a video all in itself. Uh, one of my most frequently requested videos is how I do my super high gloss bevels, right? And to give you an idea of a satin finish versus a mirror finish, I'll put two pictures up here. This one's a satin, this one's a mirror. Okay? Well, I don't call it a mirror. That, that's a weirdness about me. Anyway, uh, the difference is easy to explain but not very easy to execute. So, the satin finish can come one of two ways. It's fresh off the grinder, so it's the scratch marks from the belt, the sanding belt that sands down the steel, and in a nice uniform pattern across the length of the blade looks very nice. It's appealing. A hand rub satin is the same concept except it's lengthwise along the blade and it's all hand work. It's just like it sounds. You grab a sanding block and you sand and sand and sand. In order to get the mirror polished blade, uh, yeah, we'll just call it the mirror polished blade. In order to get that bevel, it's think of hand rub satin to 2500 grit and then buff it. Right? It's going to be way too long to explain it in this short video, but the way I do it basically is I take a satin finish blade like the one I just showed you earlier, and then I hand sand it from probably about 400 grit all the way up to 2500 grit, and then I buff it. Okay, he has another question. I decided to use high carbon steel to practice and learn with because that's something I could heat treat at home. Uh, let's see. What's the difference? The main differences between using stainless and high carbon. Is one harder than the other before heat treat? Is one easier or harder to work with? Uh, that's pretty much it. So, uh, high carbon versus stainless for a beginner. The main difference, right? And this is leave super steels out of this. So, S90V, S110V, M390. All those super steels, that's a whole nother ballpark. Don't even think about doing that stuff as a new guy. It's just going to be super frustrating. Right? Destroys abrasives and belts and a super a ton of money uh, for something that you're pretty likely going to screw up. Right? That's how it is in the beginning. I'm not just, uh, I'm included in that pile of, uh, of mess. So anyway, uh, the stainless, simple stainless, let's call it... Uh, CPM 154 or D2 is a semi stainless versus 1095, 01, 1084. <coughs> you answered your own question. The biggest difference is the heat treat. If you're going to heat treat it on your own in a propane forge, you can't do that with stainless. Right? If, uh, so you want to stick to the simple steels, 1084, 01. Right? Performance wise, I can get a carbon blade to perform as good as a stainless steel blade and vice versa, depending on the steel, right? Now, there is something nice and old-timey like a, like a 52100 chef knife versus a stainless chef. That 52100 is probably going to perform better than a stainless chef, but it's not stainless. You get it? So there's a little bit of a trade-off. Negligible at best. Most people won't be able to tell. So. Before I get too rambly here to answer your question, if you're going to send out your heat treating to something like Peter's Heat Treat or True Grid or something like that, then you could use stainless. Yeah, no problem. It's a little more expensive. It's a little harder on your, your belt, a little harder on your drill bits, but you get more money for a stainless knife than you do a high carbon knife typically, right? Most people want stainless because they don't want to have to maintain a blade. And that's a generalization, of course. Uh, if you're doing your heat treat at home and that's it, stick with high carbon. 
until you're ready for stainless or you can afford to uh, upgrade to a heat treating oven and thinking about cryogenics and all that stuff so let's not overcomplicate it first get yourself some 1084 and start grinding okay Grussing Custom Knives asks hey Mike got a question I don't have a surface grinder and I've been surface grinding them by putting it up to the platen with a magnet right, been there <laughs> uh, I know it's not that flat or perfect are there any other ways without spending uh, fifteen hundred dollars for a surface grinder uh, there are other ways to do it but they are terribly time-consuming right so the easiest and simplest way if, if you look at my uh, why flatness is important video is the granite surface plate you will get very flat but it's gonna take forever right it's really gonna take some elbow grease and that you know nobody wants to sit there and sand a knife flat like this for two hours I've done it that way. It's miserable. Uh, another way you could do it is a disc grinder. As I covered a little bit in the video, there's there's a number of different ways. Uh, but you're looking for a way where you don't have to go out and buy an expensive machine. Uh, I know some guys outsource it, right? So they'll send their, their blades out to get double disc ground. So if you send your stuff out for heat treat, after it leaves the heat treater, you send it to the surface grinding guy and he'll grind it down for you. That's another way to do it. They charge uh, X amount of dollars per blade. I don't know. I never looked at to it, into it. I just kept it in-house. Now, as far as my surface grinder being $1,500, uh, mine wasn't. Right? I'm fortunate en enough. I live in New York, and Connecticut, New York, like all here on the northeast uh, of the country, there are a ton of old machines just sitting around. Nobody's using them. Mine's a 1968, uh, and I got lucky. I paid $250 for it. Uh, it probably cost me more to move it than it did to buy it. Uh, but either way, it was nowhere near $1,500. Used ones around here typically go for $300 to $1,000. Uh, but again, then you're getting into expensive machine budget. But keep your eyes peeled. I, I stalked Craigslist and eBay uh, like a maniac for three months and then I saw this deal and it was in pieces and people told me don't buy it don't buy it I went and I bought it anyway and it turns out I got a great deal so hopefully that answers your question uh, if it's just a fixed blade uh, grussing custom knives if it's just a little fixed blade as long as you're not super aggressive on the flat platen it shouldn't be too bad right run your belts real tight uh, but when you start looking into folders and you got tolerances like like that, you're gonna have to surface grind or at least granite surface plate something. So hopefully that helps you out. All right, next up we got paintball NSK. Hey dude, I saw a photo on your Instagram where he treated the spine to make a cool rainbow pattern down to the blade. Uh, can you show us how to get that cool pattern? Uh, actually, there's no trick to that. It's certain steels. I know D2 does it, and this steel in particular is CTS XHP. I uh, heat treated it myself, and that's just a byproduct of the heat treat and temper cycle. Just a natural rainbow in the steel, if you will. And uh, this is how it came out of the oven, so there is no trick to it. Certain steels will do that. I know some of them will, I think it's 5160, will turn electric blue. So you get some cool colors. Most of the time it's some uh, hay or straw color though. But certain steels will turn those cool colors. So no trick to it. Uh, let's see. I'm having a hard time with the curves in my flat grinds. This is still paintball NSK. With the curve in my flat grinds. Oh, I know where you're going with this. I had the same problem. So do I have a flat ground knife? Well, this is a shop knife. Uh, flat ground and this is one of my early knives too actually it's all covered in garbage and gunk and stuff so but but I'll use this on an example he wants to know to follow the belly uh, the curve of the knife what do you do do you pull the handle away and follow the tip in like this right do you do one of these and follow the tip like that or he asks do you just go straight across like this and not follow the tip in uh, the first one and the second one is the answer. So I teach people, and the way I did it too, I, the way I learned, 
is you follow that belly in. So I like to keep my control hand right on the transition point. So you get here, and then once you get to the belly, follow it in, follow the tip in. Now it gets difficult out here because you don't have a lot of blade to stabilize off of, right? So you get out here, and now it wants to do one of these and it gets really wonky and hard to control. So my tip is support hand on the transition point, so right where it starts to curve, and then follow it in like that. Gently pull out and you'll get a feel for it after some time, but it does take some time to get it. Okay. You know what? What time are we at? I don't know. My camera doesn't tell time. It's great. So we're going to, yeah, we're going to have to split this into two sections. So I'll do one more and then we'll go into part two. Uh, Rogue in Washington 1775 says, always entertaining, Mike. Great videos. One question. What's the grizzly hanging over your head in the background? This guy right here. I just released a video on it. It's a shop air filter. Yeah, hopefully keep some of the stuff uh, in there and out of my lungs and out of my electronics. So watch that video. I just uploaded it today. Uh, and one critique, he says, look into the camera and stop watching yourself. Guilty as charged. I just did it while he was... <laughs> yes, I'm definitely guilty of that. So I'm watching this little screen right here next to the camera to make sure I'm in frame uh, to make sure when I show you something I can see it. As you can see, I'm not looking at the lens, which is over here. I'm looking at the little screen to see where I'm at. But when I'm this close to the camera, right, I'll sneak in a little closer. I'm clearly not looking at you. I'm looking at the screen. So he wants me to engage a little bit more eye contact with the lens itself. And it's it's difficult. And I, I saw this comment a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I've been trying to do it. And I, I have a, such a hard time of actually focusing. I have to consciously remind myself to look into the lens. So, ah, oh, I just did it again. Alright, that's it for this one guys. I'm going to come back with a part two and answer the rest of the questions. This is Mike here from Ecom Knives and I'll catch you on the next video.